we have a we have a lapel microphone for you. So maybe just a little bit closer to this one. Great. Okay. Thanks so much, Dr. Morning. I'm uh, Dick Van from uh, uh, Duke University and the and the Dives Alert Network. And what I'm going to do today is talk to you a little bit about the the methods for evidence-based decompression that were developed uh, to a large degree by the U.S. Navy, and then uh, then we'll consider how these might be applied to uh, decompression safety in tunneling. Well, here are the topics. I'm going to do a brief history of some of the relevant issues in compressed air work. This will naturally lead us to the question of what is safety, in particular what is decompression safety, which will direct us to this notion of probability, DCS probability in particular, as a metric of safety. We'll talk a little bit about how to estimate uh, DCS probability on a conceptual level. And then we'll get into the question of uh, how environmental conditions can affect the probability of decompression sickness. And lastly, we'll uh, end up by uh, dis discussing a little bit about the possible applications to uh, uh, tunneling operations and decompression safety under those conditions. Decompression sickness is really a man-made disease or an injury, a, a product of the Industrial Revolution uh, that followed from the development of the air pump. Now, uh, if you go back to the, to the 19th century, there was a, uh, a great many fatalities that would occur. And what I've done here is to show some of these, these early contracts here and the num number of fatalities occurred. And I, I've lined them up as a, as a function of the working pressure. This is just the location and, and the years. And, and what you notice here is that somewhere between 26.4 PSI and 32.4 PSI, there started to be fatalities, all the way down to the, the very worst one, which uh, was the... St. Louis Bridge, the, uh, the Eads Bridge, uh, where, had, where there were 14 fatalities. Now, a fatality is an obvious endpoint. Even a casual observer will know that that's not uh, uh, something that you want to uh, address. Uh, decompression sickness is a little bit more subtle. It's generally self-limiting. It will go away. Sometimes uh, it can be very serious. Sometimes it can be permanent. But most of the time, it would just, it would just resolve after a while. And... Uh, on top of that, I'm going to jump a little bit ahead here, was the, the problem of decompression sickness and dysbaric osteonecrosis, or bone rot, uh, and D-O-N, uh, was, was uh, identified later on as a, uh, having a statistical association with decompression sickness. And this was work done at the uh, Decompression Sickness Central Registry at the University of Newcastle upon time. And what they did, and a lot of this work was done by Tony Evans, uh, did a case control study and they looked at 85 compressed air workers who had DON and the controls were 426 control uh, case on workers without DON. And what they found was that the strongest association of cases with the number of decompression sickness events that an individual had from exposures at greater than two bar gauge, or 29 PSIG. Well, this went back to looking at some of the very earliest uh, exposures. Uh, as it turns out, over the past 20 years, the evidence of uh, dysbaric osteonecrosis in, in divers or caisson workers with the newer procedures that are out there is, is much less apparent. And so it's, it's not at all certain uh, that, that it still exists. Now, I, I don't think that's been uh, absolutely uh, demonstrated for sure, but it doesn't appear to be a problem. And for example, they shut down the, uh, uh, the decompression sickness central registry uh, at the University of Newcastle. The Navy no longer requires, uh, requires this. So it doesn't seem to be as it, as though it's as much of a problem as it used to be. Well, let's look at a few of the, uh, the compressed air codes. I'm going to focus, this is hardly going to be complete, but I'm going to focus on 
US and UK codes, and there are a lot of them in Europe, in France, and Germany, in the, in the Netherlands. And uh, I want you to, uh, to pay attention to uh, a couple of things here in particular. One, the incidence of decompression sickness, and two, the occurrence or incidence of dysbaric osteonecrosis. Now, as far as I could tell, the earliest code went back to 1922. It was in the US, it was New York State code. And, and this was actually used uh, up until 1969, as far as I know. And this was from a, a work of uh, Eric Kinwall, who in Milwaukee, who reported a DCS incidence of 1.4%. But if he did an anonymous survey of, the, of the, the workers, he found it was closer to 5%. And of the people that he examined, about 35% of them had uh, DON. The, the Brits seem to have gotten into uh, the codes in 1936, and this was the Institution of Civilian Engin Engineers. And I think this was such an unsuccessful uh, code that it, it did not, wasn't used very much. The, the, the one that, that appeared to be used, the next one that, that came online, uh, was the, uh, the Peyton and Damont tables. And I think the Tyne Tunnel was probably the first place it was used an overall incidence of about nine tenths of a percent in 350 DCS cases. Fifteen of these folks uh, that they, they checked had uh, dysbaric osteonecrosis. Then in 1956, at the Dartford Tunnel, there was six percent DCS uh, in 689 cases, uh, working up to a maximum of 28 psig. Clyde Tunnel in uh, 1958, 19 uh, percent DON. Then, in uh, 1963, the, in the U.S., the Washington State tables came along. They were, they were uh, developed by Jerry Duffner, who was a, a retired uh, Navy diving medical officer. And as far as I know, they were adopted by OSHA, and I think they may still be the standard. Some of you may have a better, better sense of that. Uh, they were used in Milwaukee. Uh, Air Kenwall uh, was, was, had medical supervision of, of that. And, he uh, found a 1.6% instance of DCS. 33% of the, of the workers that he looked at had uh, DON. Then in 1966, the Blackpool tables were developed by Val Hempelman at uh, Royal Naval Physiological Laboratory. And they were used here, just some of the numbers and uh, some of the contracts. 1966, Dungeness, 7 tenths of a percent DCS, 8% DON. Uh, 1975, Hong Kong, six uh, tenths of a percent DCS and 793 cases, 1.3 percent uh, DON, uh, 47.9 uh, PSI. Uh, Lowscroft, 1986, 1.3 percent DCS, 15 percent, uh, 15 cases, 29 PSIG, and then in Japan, 1997, six and a half percent DCS, 92 cases, and that was at a higher pressure. 46.3%. Uh, well, uh, this is a very interesting uh, case here. And this came out of the, the Tyne Tunnel in 1948. And, and this is the phenomenon of acclimatization. And you'll notice here that, that uh, what I've plotted here is a percent DCS here on the x a y axis is a function of the number of exposures. And this is basically the number of daily exposures. And there are three groups of men that, that fall pretty much on top of each other. And so you see that at the, your very first exposure, uh, your uh, DCS incidence is going to be 10 to 12 percent. And then over a period of several weeks, it, it drops off and, and it finally settles out here at around the, the mean of 9 tenths of a percent. And the, the, uh, the medical supervision at the time found that this to be totally satisfactory because the feeling was that 2% was the normal acceptable limit after uh, the, the set susceptible men or the, the girly men had uh, taken themselves out of, uh, out of the, this line of business. So they felt very comfortable with this nine tenths of a percent. Well, you, you see this uh, later on, they found that a number of these peoples went on and, and developed uh, dysbaric osteonecrosis. Now I should point out that None of these people uh, in these three groups dropped out. So there were no dropouts uh, in, uh, that distinguished this data. 
Now, now another issue here is that we we've, we've talked pretty much about the 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 average DCS incidence for the entire contract. Well, that's an oversimplification, as as this slide indicates, and you see here. This shows the DCS incidence as a function of the working pressure and also the working time. For example, if uh, you worked uh, less than four hours, you had a fairly low incidence of, uh, of decompression sickness. But if your working time was greater than four hours, it went up. And it went up uh, uh, essentially proportionally to the, uh, uh, the, the pressure that you were working at. So, uh, this is not an ISO risk problem. It depends on what you're doing and when you're doing it. Acclimatization can be an issue, and the, the, the pressure and the time that you're working uh, can be an issue as well. Now, uh, the big improvement came along with the introduction of oxygen decompression. Actually, probably the first use of oxygen decompression was in uh, 1908 uh, by Bornstein in Germany. Uh, and then uh, there was also more or less experimental work, although lots of uh, uses of oxygen, around 14,000 uh, uh, decompressions, in the development of the, uh, uh, the Queens Midtown Tunnel in New York City in 1938. But then there was a, uh, a fire in Japan in, in 1959 that resulted in six deaths. And we all know that oxygen is, uh, is a, uh, a fire hazard. And, uh, even though the Navy has been using oxygen for years and years, it really slowed down the, the introduction of oxygen to compressed air work. The, the, the next use that I could determine was in uh, Germany in the Kiel Canal. They had uh, five tenths of a percent de decompression sickness uh, uh, out of 19 cases. And I want you to note here the the working pressures here. This was 56 psi. This is a, a higher working pressure than we saw with those early codes. Now in Sydney, 1996, four tenths of percent DCS, eight cases, 43.5 uh, percent uh, of psi. Uh, in in the Netherlands, a Western Scheldt, uh, four tenths of a percent, and these were five cases, 60.9 psi. Uh, Berlin. Three tenths of percent, one DCS case, 51 uh, P, uh, PSI, G. Lyon, tenth of a percent, three cases, 47.9 percent. Berlin, two tenths of a percent, five cases, 27.5. Uh, the Hague, two hundredths of a percent, two DCS cases, 20.5, rather low pressure there. And, uh, but oxygen was not the only thing that was going on here. They got rid of decanning or surface decompression because that was associated with uh, uh, decompression sickness and bone necrosis. Uh, fewer and shorter exposures, thanks to tunnel boring machines, uh, for for one uh, uh, reason. Better DCS reporting, better medical supervision, and improved operator training. What about acclimatization and and dysbaric osteonecrosis? Well. When you start dropping your incidence of decompression sickness down so low, it can be pretty difficult to demonstrate uh, acclimatization statistically. So it's possible that it's there, but it hasn't been demonstrated in diving. We haven't been able to show decompression, uh, acclimatization to decompression sickness in diving, although we have been able to show that the bubbles that circulate through the, uh, uh, the venous blood uh, do appear to undergo an acclimatization effect with multiple exposures in diving. So it may be that this is a very sensitive uh, technique for measuring, call it decompression stress, not decompression sickness. Uh, there is still some minor effect, but it seems to be much less of a problem than it used to be. And you really don't want to have acclimatization uh, of any significance. You want to be as safe on your first exposure as you are on the rest of them. So we're still a little bit in the dark uh, about that. Uh, once again, dysbaric osteonecrosis appears to be much less of a problem than it used to be. I don't know how well it's been examined in, in uh, uh, recent uh, contracts. So that, that's a, a remaining uncertainty. Now, this brings us naturally to the question of safety. You look in the dictionary, safe means free from injury. 
Well, I mean, most activities have some risk of injury. You go driving in your car. We, we never think about that. We just do it. Uh, you know, getting out of bed in the morning, there's some risk of uh, injury there. Staying in bed, it's got risk too. So the, the point being that safety is the acceptable risk of injury, where acceptability is determined by the probability and the severity of the injury. So clearly knee pain is going to be more acceptable than is paralysis. And a treatable injury, such as knee pain, is going to be more acceptable than a permanent injury, such as bone necrosis. There are other factors as well that, that influence the, uh, your choice of acceptable probability. If you have easy access to therapy, that's good. Uh, you may be willing to accept a little bit higher uh, uh, probability. If it's going to uh, interrupt your work, ske work schedule significantly, that's, then you want to have a lower probability. How does it affect worker morale? That could be a big question too. And another big one I think you all recognize is a concern for litigation. Uh, the bigger that concern, the lower will be the, your, your acceptable uh, uh, probability. And then efficiency. Uh, clearly, no contractor wants to pay workers to decompress because that's not efficient. So you, you want to reduce the decompression time as much as possible consistent with safety. Well, what probabilities have been considered acceptable in the past? Uh, I mentioned earlier the Institution of uh, Civil Engineers in, in the UK, uh, back from 1936. 2% was just fine after all the susceptible people have weeded themselves out. Uh, in in uh, 2000, US Navy uh, decided for themselves that 2% mild decompression sickness was OK, but they only wanted about a tenth of a percent serious. And bear in mind, the Navy has very good medical supervision. They have uh, uh, treatment readily available. And uh, plus, they have operational requirements that, that may uh, uh, lead them to accept a, a slightly higher risks. If you look at commercial diving uh, in the North Sea, they were only wanting about 5 tenths of a percent and of mild uh, DCS, and no serious DCS at all. Well, everybody recognizes none is, is not really realistic, so just very low. If you look at the Gulf of Mexico, a tenth of a percent mild DCS and 0.025% serious. Well, what's going on here? Why, why are these, uh, uh, these folks, particularly in, in, in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, you got to guess that this may be that uh, litigation is more likely in, in U.S. waters, and consequently, they want to be uh, uh, quite safe. But what you should be getting right now is that DCS probability is really a metric of safety. And can we use this in order to define what we should be doing with regard to decompression safety? All right, the, the Brits have, uh, have attacked this problem. You, you've seen this uh, uh, mentioned before, uh, a LARP and a LORA. And this comes from a general consideration of risks, and it's a, an HSE uh, uh, report from 19, 2001, reducing risk, protecting people, HSE's decision-making process. And they go through in excruciating detail here. A LARP is as low as reasonably practical, a LARA as low as reasonably achievable. I'm not really sure what the difference is between the two, but if uh, you look at the rationale here, it's, it's, it's pretty reasonable. Avoid the imposition of duties that no one can fulfill as absolute safety cannot be guaranteed. Ensure preventive and protective actions are commensurate with the risks. And then give choices to the duty holders, the contractors, uh, on how to meet these objectives. Uh, there's a lot of handwriting in this report, a lot of uh, uh, detail on how to go about this. I, I think I might always, all it amounts to uh, the contractor has to do the due diligence so that he feels comfortable of standing up in court and saying, we have done everything that we possibly could within reason. 
And uh, you really can't do uh, much more than that. Now, let me give you an example about from another field uh, that uh, on how they approach this, uh, th this idea of acceptable risk. And that is uh, the risk of uh, radiation in space. The, the rule of thumb that NASA has, uh, has, uh, has accepted for how much radiation exposure would be not more than a 3% risk, excess risk of developing cancer for an astronaut. So that's the kind of subjective uh, uh, judgments that you have to make when you're addressing, uh, addressing risk. This is John Scott Haldane. He introduced the notion of stage decompression in 1908. And stage decompression is where you come up rapidly initially, and then you slow down in progressive decompression stages. And this was really responsible for eliminating virtually all of those deaths that occurred in the 19th century. And uh, getting rid of a lot of the uh, a lot of the very serious decompression sickness and, and a lot of the, the milder stuff too. Well, it didn't quite uh, work when you got to to longer exposures. And over the years, uh, people have modified Haldane's procedure, and and these are generally referred to nowadays as neo-Haldanian models. But they're they're very very uh, useful. Those, all those oxygen decompression. Uh, uh, programs that we talked about earlier, that's largely uh, from Neo-Haldanian methods. So it's, uh, this was tremendously Im important work that was done. Look around. Do you see anybody with whiskers like this? You know, I swear a lot of our problems today would probably go away if more people had these whiskers. Uh, so this brings us to the notion of how we uh, estimate DCS probability. And particularly to this idea of evidence-based decompression. Now, this is a, a four-part process. The first part is a biophysical model. And the biophysical model describes your notions of bubble formation and intergas exchange. And Haldane, the Haldane model was the original biophysical model. And then these neo-Haldanian models that have been so successful in reducing the, the incidence of decompression sickness uh, have, uh, have been introduced uh, later and, and have been very, very useful. The difficulty is there was no way, no notion of DCS probability here. So you had no touchstone that you can come back and, and join up with the, the real practical world uh, as decompression, uh, the probability of decompression sickness would give you. And that's where, that's where we're heading now. In order to do that, we need exposure data. That's the pressure time profile, pressure time and gas, and the DCS outcome. Was there decompression sickness or was there not decompression sickness? And then you take some statistical methods. And, and right now, survival analysis is probably the most popular method. Uh, Bayesian analysis is, is another technique that could be used. And what you do is to find the best fit, statistical fit, of the biophysical uh, model to the exposure data. Uh, once you have that, you can compare models quantitatively. You can say model A is no different from model B, or it's better than model B. And you can do this for multiple models. And then you use the best model that fits the, uh, the empirical data best in order to predict schedules with whatever acceptable D DCS probability you decide upon. And the, the schedules in the US Navy diving manual, which went in in 2008, are all based on this process. It would be wonderful if it was that simple. Unfortunately, it is not. And the reason is because the environmental conditions can have a, a very profound impact on the the, uh, the incidence of decompression sickness on the probability of decompression sickness. So we need to spend some time going over these. Now, the first thing I'll talk about is the distribution of decompression stops. That's, that's quite important in determining the, uh, the uh, probability of decompression sickness. Next, we're going to look at a few effects that have been uh, uh, studied experimentally uh, that affect blood flow. Uh, and that includes temperature, immersion, and exercise. And the reason this is important is because blood flow or perfusion 
controls nitrogen uptake and nitrogen washout. But this is a little subtle, as you will see. Nitrogen uptake occurs while you're at your working pressure. Nitrogen washout occurs during decompression. So you have to be on your toes to, to think what effects these are going to have. Uh, another thing that we discovered is that exercise promotes bubble formation. So exercise can affect both blood flow and it can affect bubble formation. And this can, can work against you. So you have to be uh, cognizant of this. But remember, these are the principles are general. The environments are not general. In other words, uh, what we need to do is focus on how the, the physiological part of effects in the, of the environmental conditions will alter the risk of decompression sickness through bubble formation and through inner gas exchange. And then we need to be able to use these to our advantage to make the, uh, our, our work safer for both the, uh, uh, the compre uh, compressed air worker and also the, the contractor. All right, this is an example of uh, a comparison of two uh, decompression schedules and to, to look at the distribution of decompression stops. And this is work done by, by Wayne Gurth down, uh, down at the Navy. And you know, the, the question here, this is a dive to a depth of 170 feet of seawater for 30 minutes. And these are two decompression schedules. And you'll notice the distributions of decompression time are different. The total decompression time is the same, but one has uh, deeper decompression stops than the other. And this is a, uh, it's still a, a common idea in, uh, in recreational and technical diving. The deeper decompression stops are better than shallower decompression stops, in, once again, in the context of diving. Well, what did you find out? Uh, the, the, as the results came out, it was safer if you uh, decompressed with the shallower stops. And, and you can see there are almost 200 trials of each one of these, uh, each one of these uh, dive profiles. And that's a very, very strong statistical test that shows uh, which one of these better. Now, that doesn't mean that we know what the optimal path for decompression is. It might be different from either one of these. But uh, uh, for a comparison of these particular two schedules, there's no question at all. Now let's look at, at uh, the issue of thermal state in DCS. And this also was work of Wayne Gurth down in, at, at the Navy Experimental Diving Unit. What they did was to, to look at uh, a dive to uh, 120 feet for bottom times of 25, 30, 50, or 70 minutes. And they used multiple bottom times because they initially they didn't want to subject the uh, experimental volunteers to too much risk of decompression sickness. And you'll see how this plays out. And they explored two, two temperatures, cold of uh, 80 degrees Fahrenheit and warm 97 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. And I should say that all the, every one of these dives had the same amount of decompression time, 91 minutes. Now you might say, 80 degrees, hey, that sounds toasty warm. Well, if you're at rest for 91 minutes, uh, you're going to get mighty chilly uh, sitting there in, in 80 degree water. So that made a big difference. Now, another issue here was the interaction between exercise, exposure suit, and uh, water temperature. In order to make this as, uh, as simple as possible to interpret, they had their, their volunteers wearing just swim trunks and t-shirts. So they were exposed, their skin was exposed to the water temperature. And that uh, got rid of the effect of, uh, of any kind of exposure suit. Uh, and, and then they looked at four conditions. They looked at uh, warm on the bottom, cold during decompression, cold on the bottom, warm during decompression, cold, cold, or warm, warm. So they had four different, de uh, uh, four different conditions to look at. Now I'm going to show you the results, but I want you to try to think your way through this. What do you think is going to be the worst set of conditions here, given how we realize that uh, Temperature affects perfusion, which then affects inner gas exchange. So I'll give you three seconds to come up with an answer, and then I'll show you what it, show you what it is. What is going to be the worst set of conditions? Warm cold. Why might that be? When you're warm, 
at pressure on the bottom, you're going to take up more inert gas since you have greater blood flow. Uh, all right, what is going to be the worst set of conditions? Uh, excuse me, I had that backwards. So the best set of conditions are going to be uh, the cold, warm. The worst set of conditions are going to be warm, cold. And you can see here that uh, the warm, cold, uh, they, they didn't get uh, move up beyond 30 minutes because they had uh, about 20% decompression sickness. Whereas for cold, warm, no DCS at 30 minutes, no DCS at 50 minutes, and only two cases out of 158 trials uh, at 70 minutes. So that was definitely the, the most successful condition. Now, the other two were intermediate, and, and it appears that uh, uh, warm, warm was uh, uh, worse than, uh, than uh, uh, cold, cold. As you can see, uh, at 25 minutes, it was about 15% DCS, but uh, at 70 minutes, uh, they had 20% uh, DCS. So uh, they didn't do as many studies there. But the, the take-home message is you need to think about the conditions, uh, environmental conditions, and how they're going to affect inner gas uh, exchange. Now, what's the, what's the take-home message here for diving? They put the, the divers in a hot water suit. Hot water suit has got uh, hot water coming down from the surface, going through the suit, keeps you nice and toasty warm. Well, you can control that, can't you? You can make those divers cool when they're on the bottom at pressure, and then you can warm them up during decompression. Well, certainly you're not going to do this with your, your compressed air workers, but the principles still apply. Anything you can think of that you can do to manipulate the environment to uh, affect either uh, uh, perfusion, uh, blood flow, or bubble formation is going to be beneficial. For example, one of the problems with uh, uh, tunnel work is dehydration. Since you have high temperature and high humidity, we want to make sure that, that uh, all your folks get plenty to drink, and particularly uh, uh, using a, a balanced electrolytes fluids. There's something you can do, and I, I'm sure you you know you know you know the environment. You'll be able to think of things that, that might be useful as well. Well, the the next the next example is going to come from uh, uh, space, uh, particularly extravehicular activity uh, from the uh, uh, space station. Uh, but before getting into these, I want to give you another potential application of tunnel boring machines. Uh, you remember I mentioned earlier that NASA is concerned about uh, the risk of radiation. Uh, and they have this no more than a 3% uh, excess uh, cancer risk uh, uh, for radiation. Radiation uh, in space is a huge problem. We live within the Van Allen belts. We've got uh, ozone on top of us. So we don't get too much radiation here. You can't control that when you're uh, outside of low Earth orbit. If you're on the moon, if, you're, if you go to Mars, and there's no good way. You don't really have much uh, uh, time to anticipate when you're going to get hit by radiation. One of the things that can be done, though, is to tunnel. Is to tunnel into an asteroid, tunnel into the moon, or tunnel into Mars. So maybe you'll have another application for these tunnel boring machines in, in a couple of years. So keep that in the back of your mind. All right, so the space station and the, and the space shuttle are uh, have a, a shirt sleeve environment. One atmosphere pressure, 14.7 PSIA uh, with air. They want, they want to do that so they don't have to recalibrate any of their instruments. They can do the science in, in the same environment as, as, uh, uh, as on Earth as far as pressure and composition is concerned. Now, this is, this is Mike Gernhardt uh, making the first lockout from the uh, uh, the uh, the space station, this is the, the airlock, uh, and he is wearing a space suit that has, uh, is filled with 100% oxygen, and the pressure in it is 4.3 PSI, A, absolute pressure. That's equivalent to 30,000 feet of altitude. Now, if we decompress right here as we are from this pressure up to 30,000 feet, most of us would have serious, if not fatal, decompression sickness as a result of nitrogen uh, in our tissues that comes out and, and forms bubbles. 
So what do you do? Well, you want to eliminate that nitrogen before you go from 14.7 to 4.3. And to do that, you breathe 100% oxygen. Now, if you breathe oxygen uh, uh, and you want to eliminate virtually all the nitrogen dissolved in your tissues, you have to breathe seven or eight hours of oxygen, which is really uh, uh, excessive. And we wanted to see whether it was going to be possible to accelerate uh, nitrogen elimination by exercise. So this is the, uh, uh, the uh, design, experimental design of, of, the, uh, of the test that we conducted. This is the barometric pressure. And this is time here in hours. And what we did, we started off here at station pressure, 14.7 PSIA. And we breathed oxygen for three and a half hours. Then we would decompress to 4.3 PSI suit pressure for four hours. And we do arm exercise to simulate EVA activities while the subjects, the volunteers, were up and they were walking around in, in the chamber. And uh, the experimental conditions were during the, the oxygen pre-breathe, we had the subjects either at rest or doing light exercise. I mean really light exercise, only 25 watts, which is not much more than moving your arms and legs. Very low uh, exercise. And this is what we found out. There was double the amount of decompression sickness uh, in the folks who were at rest as opposed to the ones who, uh, who did the light exercise. And we also made measurements of nitrogen elimination through the lungs. So the answer is yes. Exercise enhanced O2 pre-breathe can get you out faster, can get you into your spacesuit faster. And that procedure was then uh, tested and adopted for, uh, for use in the, in the space station. Now, there's another issue as well, and that is the effect of uh, gravity and as compared to microgravity. As I indicated in the previous slide, DCS was common during EVA simulations on Earth, but not in the microgravity of space. Well, we knew that animal studies had found that exercise increases bubble formation. So we asked, does any gravity work that we're doing, I'm standing here moving around and there's stresses in my joints uh, as, a, as a result of being in a 1G environment, does that generate bubbles that can go on and lead to decompression sickness uh, thereafter? So to test the hypothesis, we, had, uh, we looked at a, four point, uh, a three and a half hour oxygen pre-breathe with subjects seated at rest at 14.7 PSI. And then we, when we decompressed to 4.3 PSI for four hours, we did the, the EVA arm exercise to simulate uh, uh, what they do during EVA. We had a control group who were standing and walking, an experimental group who were reclining to simulate microgravity. And this is what we found out. Uh, there was no difference in the instance of DCS in the arms between the 1G uh, and the, the microgravity simulation. But in the legs, there was a, a, a large difference uh, in support of the, the notion that, uh, uh, yes, indeed, exercise does cause generation of bubbles that can go on and, and, uh, uh, and lead to decompression sickness. So we also measured circulating bubbles, and, and th uh, this was in, in agreement as well. You know, this seems a little exotic uh, so far as uh, your world is concerned in, in tunneling, but there's really, uh, the, the principle applies here. And, and that's what I want to try to get you to think. Think principles here don't simply be locked into the notion of the environments themselves. For example, here is a comparison of the location of decompression pain in divers and compressed air workers. And this, this is looking at 189 divers and 410 compressed air workers and looking at the difference between the arms and the legs. And what you see here is that divers tend to get bent in the arms, whereas uh, compressed air workers tend to get bent in the legs. And you know, I could, I could show you a dozen other uh, studies that found exactly the same thing. This is typical. What's going on here? Well, a compressed air worker is standing and walking around, uh, whereas a diver is immersed, and those, those uh, uh, anti-gravity stresses are removed from the legs. So there's less bubble formation going on there, and there's uh, uh, more de uh, decompression sickness uh, uh, occurring. 
as well. Now, uh, this, this issue of how the environment affects decompression sickness in, in diving is, has been of interest uh, to us for quite a long time. And at the Divers Alert Network, we did a study uh, starting in 1995 and, and going through 2008, and we're in the process of writing it up right now. And uh, I want to tell you a little bit about it. We, we took advantage of these dive computers, some of which are shown here, and these are devices that uh, tell a diver uh, when to come up after an exposure. And they've essentially eliminated the use of decompression tables. Well, our interest was not in the, the decompression procedures that were used, but the fact that these dive computers would actually record the depth and the time. So we knew exactly what the divers were doing and uh, what they did. And we also got them to uh, submit information about their demographics and uh, with whether or not they had decompression sickness. And uh, uh, we collected data on over 10,000 divers. And I want to show you some of the results here. Uh, these are going to be DCS incidences in four dive locations. Now, one of the locations was what's known as liveaboard dive boats. This is the ultimate diving vacation. You get on a luxury boat for a week, and you do three or four dives a day. You eat well. It's temperate waters or tropical waters. You, you, uh, uh, it's, it's sightseeing. You're just very leisurely, very not stressful at all. People take your tanks off your back, so you don't do any work. And uh, uh, it's, it's really, it's, it's quite expensive, but it's, it's really, if you're, if you're a diver, uh, it's a fantastic uh, uh, vacation, so I am told. Now, we collected 100,000 dives there. There were eight cases of decompression sickness for an incidence of uh, point, DCS percentage of 0 0.008. Think back to uh, where we were with the, the, the tunnel uh, this is much, much lower, is it not? Uh, another group that we looked at were Cozumel dive guys. Now, these are diving professionals who will take the, uh, uh, the divers, uh, tourist divers, along these wonderful reefs, and they'll do all the organization, and they'll charge the tanks, so they're carrying the tanks around, and they can work for, for weeks without a day off. It's, it's, uh, it's a wonderful job. Uh, if you like to be out and doing a lot of diving, but it's a lot more stressful than if you're on a liveaboard and, and you're paying the big bucks for, for having all this fun. And what we found there uh, in 6,500 uh, dives, five cases of decompression sickness, was the incidence was 10 times higher than it was uh, uh, for the liveaboards. The third group was Scapa Flow Squad, uh, Scotland. Now, Scapa Flow is, is the location of the World War I German battle fleet, which was scuttled. So you've got these fantastic wrecks uh, all over the bottom there in, in Scapa Flow, and they're deeper than, than uh, most of these, these other dives. Uh, it's cold, cold water. There's a lot of current. Uh, you have, they do some decompression diving. You've got to carry a lot of tanks around, so it's a whole lot more stressful. Uh, environment. And what we found there in 15,000 dives, 27 cases of decompression sickness, 0.18% uh, uh, DCS uh, incidence there. And the last group are the ones we've talked about uh, before, U.S. Navy Experimental Diving Unit, where these folks are testing at or beyond the limits uh, that they consider safe because they want to understand those limits. And so they, they, it, this represents 3,300 uh, dives, 190 cases of decompression, six, or 5.72% DCS incidence. Now, there are two things going on here. One is the, the severity of the dive profile itself. And the other is the effect of the, uh, the environment on that dive profile. And using the, uh, the, the methodology from evidence-based decompression that I discussed conceptually, you can tease these two out. So you can get a sense for what's important uh, and, uh, uh, with regard to the dive profile and what's important with regard to the, to the environment. And what I want to do now is to 
uh, to start talking about how this might apply in tunneling. And we'll, we'll do this based around a, a case of decompression sickness that occurred in, in a, a, a Brightwater project uh, here in Seattle in 2008. Now, this is a uh, depth time profile, a pressure profile, recorded by a dive computer. Uh, and this, the scale here is in meters of seawater. Uh, now, I, uh, I don't know what decompression profile was used here. I, uh, in, in other words, who generated it? Uh, this is air decompression. And uh, this resulted in, in a dive, and I'm going to convert to, uh, to feet of seawater here. 140 feet of seawater, 62.3 psi, which is, which is high pressure so far as tunneling is concerned. 4.2 bar gauge. Uh, the time at pressure, 53 minutes. 143 minutes of decompression time. The diver had, uh, the, the uh, compressor worker had uh, whacked his elbow while he was at pressure. It was swollen and uh, it was injured. And he developed elbow pain with an ulnar nerve uh, distribution of numbness. And uh, when he got out, he was treated on U.S. Navy Table 6 and he had complete resolution after 30 minutes. So it was a, a pretty... Uh, plain vanilla case and worked out just fine. Now what I've done here, I took my ruler and I, I measured the, the travel rates and the bottom time and decompression stops and so forth. Uh, and then we figured what the TCS probability was going to be according to those four dive sites I mentioned. Now let me say right off this is wrong. You can't do this because the environments are different. So I'm, I'm assuming here, for just purposes of illustration, that the, the, the conditions of the dives would also apply to this tunnel. Recognize this is not true. This is just to give you a feel for how this methodology can be used. So for uh, the estimated DCS uh, probability uh, for the Brightwater case, if you were in the conditions of U.S. Navy trials, 9.5%, SCAPA flow, 13%, dive guides, 6.7%, liverboards, only 7 tenths of a percent. Uh, now what I want to do is look at some alternative decompression procedures here. So you can get a feel for uh, how the, the decompression uh, procedure itself will affect the, the estimated risk. Now we're going to pick here the environmental conditions under the U.S. Navy dive trials just to, to uh, for comparison. So the, the red here is the, uh, this is the, the Brightwater uh, case that occurred, 9.5% uh, DCS uh, probability here. And here's where it ends up, uh, total time of uh, about 194 minutes. And, and we're going to compare it to two air decompression tables. This is 8.2%. Uh, 8, 8 this is the 1957 U.S. Navy air table. And look where this is. This comes out right here with uh, decompression time, a uh, total dive time of 150 minutes. That's, uh, that's good, what, 50, 60 minutes shorter than uh, Brightwater, the Brightwater table. Why would that be? Well, if you, if you look at the shape of the, uh, of the, the, the decompression procedures, uh, one would conclude that these deeper stops here are allowing the, the individual to take on more inert gas, therefore resulting in a higher uh, probability of decompression sickness uh, than would, would be the case for the, the 1957 US, uh, US Navy uh, schedule. Now, if we look at the the new Navy schedule from 2008, uh, if we look at the new schedule from 2008, we see that that is really low, eight tenths of a percent. And that uh, ends up at about 270 minutes. Uh, and you'll also notice that the last stop is at 20 feet. Uh, and the, the distribution of decompression stops is intermediate between uh, the 1957 and the Brightwater. So once again, this gets back to the question of the actual distribution of decompression time. That can be important as well. Uh, now let's compare this with uh, some oxygen 
uh, decompression. Uh, the uh, uh, Walter Sturck's uh, uh, Dutch table has got 7.8% DCS and that uh, DCS probability, and that's indicated here by this solid green line. And you'll see that it has deep stops too, and it finishes up here around 150 minutes, shorter than the uh, than the uh, the bright water. And if you look at the the U.S. Navy, that's 5.7, and that finishes up uh, right here. This is the the shortest table of all. And you'll notice that it, its last stop is at 20 feet, and its distribution of decompression times is a bit shallower than 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 bright water uh, or the uh, the Dutch tables. So uh, if you look at the, the total range here uh, and you take a contractor's eye view, you're going to say, by gosh, uh, these long tables here absolutely make no sense at all. It's just much too long to be economically feasible. And indeed, uh, this, this limit here, 75 minute decompression time, applied to a, uh, a contract down in San Francisco to upgrade a tunnel that Ray, thank you very much for, for letting me have this. And, and the, the point being is it's not realistic to, to have these very long times. So the take-home message here is oxygen is your friend from the both point of view of decompression safety and also of reducing your decompression time and making it more economically feasible. All right, we're going to do something we shouldn't do once again because the, the environmental conditions are different. But what I want to do here is show you what the estimated DCS probabilities are uh, for the three air decompression procedures here and the two O2 procedures here, according to these, these different environmental conditions from diving. And you, you'll note that, uh, uh, that the, the uh, uh, liveaboard is, is clearly, the environmental conditions from the liveaboards are very lowest, and either the uh, conditions of US Navy dive trawls or SCAPA flow are highest. Uh, for illustrative purposes only, you can't make the, uh, the conclusion that the, uh, the conditions are the, going to be the same in tunneling. So let's sum up. DCS probability, that's your metric of safety. That's what you ought to be focusing on. Uh, safety, remember, it's a judgment of acceptable probability. We can put quantitative numbers to it, but ultimately, uh, as, we, as we heard in the, in the very first talk, the, you have to assess the risks and decide what you're, you feel is acceptable yourself. Uh, you need exposure data, pressure time, uh, profiles, and DC at outcomes, but you need them for the environmental conditions that are relevant here because these affect bubble formation and inner gas exchange, and they can do so in, to some degree, predictable ways that we can understand. So if, if you look at the DCS probability estimation, which is the basis for this evidence-based decompression process, you take your biophysical model, your exposure data, you use your statistical procedures to get the best fit between the two, and then you use this to evaluate and select your decompression schedules. And finally, recommendations are to collect exposure data from tunnel contracts, and then apply the methods of evidence-based decompression to evaluate and develop uh, tunnel decompression schedules. Thank you. So thank you so very much, Dr. Dan. Uh, and I'm sure there's